Ladies and gentlemen, hello everybody out there. We're taking a look at another DPC daily this time. Uh, and again, daily is like really in quotation marks because I suck at uploading every day. Uh, but we got the wonderful Tomato with us today. My man, how you doing? You uh, you you just got done uh, with a pretty nice series uh, playing in the BTS Pro Series. How you feeling? Hey, I'm feeling good. Uh, I have a clear objective in mind. And for any competitor, it's super nice to like have a clear objective because... Uh, when you're grinding every day, it doesn't feel bad. You don't feel like, what am I doing this for? But you get extra motivated. So I'm feeling great lately. That, that's an amazing answer. Uh, you're already going deep into the psychology that I was hoping we we're going to get into in this interview. <laughs> okay, it's, that's it. It's, it's good stuff. Um, what do you mean by you have a, a clear objective in mind? What's, what's, your, what's your objective? Uh, I don't want to miss next TI. I want to go to this TI-10. I feel like uh, Dota already peaked. Okay. It could be wrong, you know, you can always be wrong with this, but I feel like Dota peaked around like 2016, 2017, okay. and you know, nothing lasts forever, so I don't want to miss another TI. I know I want to go to TI 10, and I want to try my hardest every single day, every single moment. So even if I do miss it, I can just be like, I gave it my all. That's life sometimes, you know, sometimes you try your hardest and you still don't get it, but I wasn't my, I wasn't the problem, you know? interesting that's a that's a really uh i mean i think that the the like immediacy of if you say that you feel like dota's kind of peaked that uh that's like the motivation for you to get there but i feel like you're also somebody that's had a lot of motivation throughout your career that's kind of like intrinsic just a part of who you are um do, do you feel like you've sort of because you i mean we'll get into this later but you've moved around a lot to a bunch of different regions you've played everywhere it feels like you've oftentimes taken roles that are more about trying to like get as far as you can with what you got as opposed to just like taking cash in in a moment i guess is that fair yeah mm -hmm. i've always had this mentality of uh it's it's a bit annoying but it's nice like you know everything has ups and downs and like i've every time i i touch something that's kind of competitive i cannot do it half half I cannot do it so so. I I gotta go all in, man. Like even if I'm doing it casually, like for example, I I really like playing Worker Free Melee, like the one v one. I like playing Night Elf, and you know I started playing because like I never really played the game like one v one when I was a kid. So I started playing like a couple of years ago, watching the pro scene and stuff. Yeah. But then the moment I started losing, and I see that my rank is like gold and I'm low MMR, I'm like, no way, There's no <laughs> way I'm gonna be like this. And I started into this competitive habit. So yeah, I've always had like a lot of motivation towards the, being the best person of myself, trying to achieve greatness, trying to like represent my country, trying to make people proud or like become a model that people can like look back the way I also look back to certain uh, role models I had before and be like, damn, this guy's cool. I want to be like this guy. I would like to inspire people the way I, I play and I practice. That's really cool. I, I think that there's something there too about like, uh, I mean again a, a desire to to inspire people uh, i think that's why a lot of people again in esports get into it i mean for some people it's different some people like to do other stuff um and you know obviously there's the monetary component where everybody likes to make money as well but uh, i think that there's like a, a, a part of all of us that sort of is like a dorky little kid that played video games and was kind of like left alone and then you know wanting to to help out that dorky little kid now that's that's a cool uh, idea right there um, well, I, I want to get into uh, a little bit about just a quick recap of this last season. Um, you decided not to stick with the teams that were being built together in South America. Uh, for anybody that missed it, uh, Tomato did a really great interview with Mr. Big Jams on the uh, Position 6 podcast that you should go check out as well. Uh, but I was listening to some of that, and it sort of mentioned that you were uh, making this move to North America, partially to play with like you know this buddy Brial of yours that you've been friends with for a while, uh what what's this experience been like of playing uh in north america this last season uh it's very cool it's been very humbling in a way because uh south america is still like the region overall right the region overall is still like a couple steps behind the world in general like the dota is still a little too basic the pros are not as professional as they are in other regions. So when I was playing in SA, I always feel like, you know, I'm so cool because I try to apply uh, concepts from different regions. But then coming to the region and facing it 
like 1v1, you know, fighting against EG and Quincy's and talking to my captain about how to approach the game and stuff. It's way different. Um, I think this team is very rich in experience. I think Moon and Dubu are very knowledgeable guys. They're amazing. And uh, the experience has been quite great so far because at first I felt like I was going to be, uh, had to be like a pillar for the team. I had mm. to be like, I have to be strong carry, have my strong ideas and like kind of lead the team. But then the more I got to know Moon and Dubu, I realized that these guys, like, they know so much. So the first step before, like, taking control and making my own calls is listening to them and uh, kind of trying to apply the things they've learned over the years. Not only the things they've learned from them for themselves, but, like, the things they've seen throughout their career from other players, hmm. which is, like, amazing knowledge to have. So I always ask them to, like, compare me because sometimes players don't like don't like being compared to other players like they don't like being mentioned like oh you should play great king like this guy or you should play racer like this guy i don't think like this i think if you show me how this if this guy does it well i want to do it like him or better but the first step is like understand what he's doing so this whole approach it just goes very well with how moon and dubu think so the team has uh i think it fits me pretty well and i think i fit them pretty well so even if we miss the major, uh, we know the team still has a lot of potential. Yeah, and yeah, Brad's like an old body of mine. That, that's that's like a small factor, but it adds up. You know, like if it wasn't Brad, maybe I'd be a little hesitant. But you know, it's my boy Brad. I wanted to try <laughs> playing with him after so long. That's awesome. I, I think that that's really cool, and it's like that connection that maybe you two have. Um, that also you're now being instructed by, uh, you know, you can't help but th think also that the age plays a factor in this, right? You've got, you know, you, Saberlight, and Brile that are all like about 20. Am I right in that? You're all about that age. Yeah. And uh -huh. then Dubu and Moon who are a little bit older, a little bit more experienced. That's kind of been like one of the qualities that we've seen have success over the years is like younger core players put together with experienced, uh, you know, supports and what have you. Uh, do you feel like the 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 way that you've grown this season? Because it, it you didn't look nearly as good at the beginning of the season. No offense, um, but you looked a lot better towards the end. Is that the type of growth you were hoping to have over the season? Uh, do you, do you feel like you you're you're fairly pleased? I mean, obviously not going to the major sucks, but how, how, what's what's your general feelings about uh, this last season and your team as a whole right now? Uh, yeah, I think we've evolved a lot. I think going to the first weeks of the tournament. Especially uh, because we came from playing a lot of pups because last year was a little dead. No one really, there weren't big tournaments and it was all like BTS, Americas and stuff. So everyone just kind of like chilling in their house and playing pups. So say we like came in from Europe, top one. I had two accounts. I had just gotten them to 10K. I was feeling hot. <laughs> Same with Brav, which is like chilling. I'm 10.5K and you know, I'm top three, blah, blah, blah. So everyone got a little too cocky at the start. Mm. And then we started screaming teams like EG that came from uh, they're like new team and they came from uh, Singapore and Philippines, other than Isocise, right? Yeah. Even Crit from Europe. So they were a bit rusty when they came to the region. They were playing pretty bad. So we were like high ego with like winning our first scrim. <laughs> we were like, oh shit, we're so fucking good, guys. <laughs> and the team got too individualistic, if that's mm. the word. But uh, we were kind of just playing our own game and you can't do that in 2021 unless it's like specific strategy but it's very rare to see like three cores doing their own different things in right. the map it's too abusable and um, there was a period where like we struggled a lot with making plays happen we kept like losing so much every game but uh we evolved from that and uh there's a thing in life where like once you see certain stuff you can't go back to the being blind kind of thing like once you realize how good playing as a team is and how important is connecting players and understanding and communicating you realize that yeah this is what makes the game so great and so complex so i cannot go back to like you know fitting into be like saying stuff like oh no this is gonna ruin my game guys like please <laughs> don't do this no 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 it's a team game you gotta you gotta do whatever you have to do to win the game and each game is different yeah I, I mean, I think that that mirrors what a lot of people have sort of said is that like, you know, obviously, as you talk about it, the the individual accolades that your team has of, you know, getting all this crazy amount of MMR that's just inflated up there and individual skill is important. Um, but I guess that's something that I'm kind of curious about. And you, maybe you've already given an answer to this. It, 
in a couple of the interviews that I was listening to you talk about this, I was wondering, what do you think is like more important for uh, a player? Do you think like having the right attitude is more important or having the talent is more important? Uh, granted, you, you can learn to have a better attitude, but like for like the growth of a player, what, what do you think is better to have? So I think they go hand to hand. I, I think I really think it's like uh, body and mind kind of thing. Okay. It's like, uh, yes, if you have the attitude, you you will do great. You will go far. You will continue grinding. You will continue practicing. You will like have a clear objective. Go for it. But if you don't have the talent, which that's life, because there's so many humans in the world that not everybody can like do the same thing. That's that was so cool. That's why like individuals in esports are so like uh, praised and uh, looked up. Because like they're so rare, it's like one out of uh, one million. You know, there's so many Dota players, and they play every game. Yeah. So yes, you need some talent. Talent is not necessarily something like uh, not clicking very fast. It's very complex what talent means in Dota because there's a lot of intelligence into the game of like reading the map, abstract concepts of like where the enemy would be standing right now. What are they going for right now? You gotta like get uh, you gotta get into the opponent's head. You know, mm -hmm. that's like uh not normal stuff for everyday activities right. but uh i think they're both equally important honestly i think i'm not very good at either but i have a good balance <laughs> i don't think I'm... about what do you mean dude <laughs> you're just like I, mean, I, <laughs> I struggle a little, a little bit with like totem and attitude sometimes okay. you know i think everybody does but my point is like uh, I think I got a nice balance going throughout the years like when i was a kid i used to think that talent was everything then I used to believe that the practice was everything. So I was like playing 20 pups a day and just draining my mental energy out. So now I got a nice balance going, which I think is the key to everything in life. Just understand that doing one thing is not going to get you everywhere. You have to do different things. Like the human brain is very complex. And the more you understand your own brain and you play around it, then the, the further you're going to go in whatever you're doing. So. I love it. I love that. That's that's a it's a really good message to sort of get back to again at the basics of it. Um, speaking of which, getting back to basics, sort of, uh, you had mentioned before also that your your dad's been a really big part of your Dota career, uh, and you know just obviously your upbringing because he's your dad. That's just how it goes. Uh, but what's that sort of been like to have your dad? Uh, that's kind of been around a lot uh, in your Dota career. What's that experience been like for you? Okay, so being honest, at the start it was really cool. He I, I I will always be thankful to him because he's a really good dad. I think a good dad uh, pays attention to his child. He understands. He tries to understand the way he thinks because parents and children are like very similar. Right. They're kind of the same but different, which is like strange. But so I'm very similar to him, but I'm also very different. Hmm. So he kind of understood at a young age how my brain functioned with like competition. With, uh, because before I liked sports a lot, I wanted to become a professional soccer player when I was in school, mm. but I was too shy for it. Like I didn't enjoy the competition, like being out there and people seeing me. I kind of choked. I mm. practiced a lot, but when it came down to like you know scoring, I, I was so bad, so bad, man. I, it was insane <laughs> how bad I was. Like I couldn't score a goal even if I was in front of the goalie. I don't know how much you know about soccer. Did but you the point just is, like do the big like the big whiff up for the kick and then you just like completely miss it or yes, type like of thing? I would yeah. make. Thick play, and then I was in front of the goal, and I cho I, I couldn't kick it. It was so bad. I kicked like if I was like five years old. I was like 13, 12, let's say, and I kicked like a five year old. So bad. So that made me look away from sports and look more into esports. Mm -hmm. And uh, he helped. He's helping me like everything. He's helped me like he tried to discipline me. He tried to teach me like good habits. Uh, give me different examples around the world how like Japanese practice, how the Germans practice, all these wow. type of stuff. And uh, back then, I used to be very fan of the Koreans because I watch a lot of StarCraft 2. So oh, hell yeah. I was very fond of them. I like respect them a lot. Like the way they dedicate every day to their passion and their goal, which is like really cool. And uh, so, yeah. So at the start, it was really cool. It was really nice. But then I hit like an age, which is like 16, 17, where you're like trying to uh, find something that identifies you. It's just a natural process in life, right? You're growing up and you wanna you wanna be something. You wanna be someone. You want people to look at you and think you're cool. And uh, everyone with us, like deep down, everybody wants it a little bit, one way or the other. You wanna hear someone say it to you. Maybe it's like different person, but you wanna hear someone say it, like, "Wow, you're cool." That's like 
that means everything with Euro 16, 17. So he got so close that he kind of took some merit from me, and I hate it so much. Like, uh, mm. I didn't want people to be like, oh, yeah, this guy is good because, you know, he's dad. I'm like, that just ruined it for me. I hate it so much. And I feel mm. like sometimes media, they they look at parent and child like that way. Like, they're the same person. They're like, oh, yeah, this is dad. This is son. They're so similar. The same thing. This guy's just junk. So this guy played told him what to do every time and he did it but no i did the grind you know i did the yeah. coming after school every day and playing pups all day doing my homework staying up late and having to do my homework like midway to school because i'd say that playing dota that was me that was my life and it was a struggle and it kind of ruined my relationship with him but a bit because uh he also has a very open mind so whatever he thinks or he believes in he will talk about it strongly hmm. So it got it always backfired to me because I'm a quiet guy. I don't I don't talk much unless uh I think it's like good to talk. So yeah. it kind of damaged my reputation a lot. The whole Mason thing, which I assume you remember, yeah, it hurt me so much. It still does. Like still, some people are like me, but you know, like Igor Kosan, Igor Kosan, and I'm mm. not Igor Kosan. I'm Tomato. I'm myself. Right. And what happened between Mason and my dad is a whole different topic. A different topic than what happened with me and mason i was mason's friend my dad was not mason's friend i got mason into the team but my dad was my, also the coach of the team so right. it was just a it mess sounds, it, it was just like a mess such a mess man and it's not the first time that this affected me because i uh, when bgj saw there was a whole thing going on too where like my parents they're split they're divorced mm. so when like I was still under age, so I needed their permission. And every time I went to my mom, she complained that I went to my dad. And when I went to my dad, she, he complained wow. that I went to my mom. And then Jack had to deal with all of this stuff. It's something that I've never talked about, but it did affect. Jack was like, holy shit, what did I get myself into? You know, it's like right. crossfire between two parents that got divorced and they kind of hate each other in a way. Jeez. So, yeah, it was rough. I, was, I didn't like people seeing it. I didn't. I didn't want people to see me as a child. I I struggled my entire life to, uh, I was a kid, you know, but I wanted people to perceive me as an adult, something you always want when you're an adolescent. But like, want totally. people to see you as a grown up person and you want them to respect your opinion. And it was so rough when these type of things happen because everyone just looks at me as a kid, like a puppet. And uh, yeah, it was like up and down. Right now, he has his own team. Yeah. Uh, he played Eagle Boys. I had to play him like la last. Oh, a couple of days ago, yeah, it was rough to play. I felt a little odd. I know people are mm. gonna meme about it and stuff, especially in Peru. Right. But that's life. That's the competition. I'm yeah. just glad he's still doing the thing. And right now, our relationship's much better because I've also gotten past those issues and those insecurities. But it was definitely a struggle for a while. From like after TI seven to like TI nine, it was just up like that's a long roller coaster freaking of time, man. That's a long yeah. time. I, I'm sorry that you went through all that. I think that it's, you know, the thing that you I find really interesting hearing you talk about it is that, like, you, you sort of talk about it through the context of needing to get out on your own, which I think is something that everybody can relate to at some point with their parents. Um, and the thing that's so funny about it is that, like, for so many people that I think try and get into esports, it's that their parents aren't supportive of them. That's the problem. And for you, the problem was that they were supportive and wanted you to get into it. Uh, yeah. and it's like it it it, it can become a, a double edged sword depending upon which way you look at it. And I think um, that in general, too, there's like a there there's like a, a way that I, I know, at least for a lot of people that like the relationship can get better with time, but you need that distance away um, because otherwise it's just it's just going to get worse. That's why when you mentioned that I've been different regions, that's also why too. Because when right. I was in Europe, for example, I had to live alone. I mean, not alone. I live with Weha, but right. I was like 17 and I left my house to live three months <laughs> in Europe in a house I've never been before. In wow. Playing with a guy I, I had never met before, you know, like met him once, <laughs> something like TI. How was that, that was experience? It. What was that like living with them? What, what, what was sort of your days like? Uh, it was really cool. I I gained so much weight when I was back there. <laughs> I gained so much weight because like I was just living the dream. I my relationship with Weha was kind of like I was his little brother, and he was my big brother. So he just bought me all the food I wanted. He was trying to take me to clubs all the time, you know, to like <laughs> have fun. He had a super cool Mercedes. So like we late night, we always like played music and went for like uh, I don't know. He was like drifting and stuff. He was so cool. Oh he was God. such a cool guy. It, it was kind of like a dream to play with 
especially because 2016 he got second place at TI. Right. So and then he missed TI seven. So he was like, Wait, I'm playing with this guy. You know, I was just I was just trying my best to like get him to the next TI. I wanted to be that guy that bro, we have active fame, you know. I was just trying my hardest. And I also met his family, which is really cool. I still have a good relationship with Weha. Hmm. It's just he has his own team, he's just doing his own life. And same for me. But last time I saw him, which is like an event back in February. 2019 i think or, mm. no, 2020 right before covid the we we talked a lot it was nice to see him it was, it was nice to see each other and be like yeah you're still like you will for it you will always be welcome to my home that's what he told me and it was pretty nice to hear that's so heartwarming so, i love that it, it was so fun it was i don't know it's like I met this guy, you know, super good at Dota. We play games all the time. He coached me so much. He told me, like, some things that I still apply today and that I think that makes me a good player mm -hmm. are things that he was very strong about that I should learn back when we were playing together. Yeah. Because I was his carry and he was my position four. So he was just trying to teach me concepts about, like, moving around the map, trying to make turn me into a mature core because I was a young player that just switched to carry. So my concept of carry was just like, I'm going to hit some crypts, give me <laughs> anti last pick, and I'm going to carry your ass. But that's not everything Dota. Right. He was the first guy to open my eyes like that. That's really cool. I think that, that there's an interesting part there as well, which is like the eventually becoming competition later. These teammates of yours that you form really strong bonds with. And then uh, I, I feel like there's sometimes where people try and hold back a little bit some of their information or not sort of reveal everything that they know about it at certain points. But it sounds like he was really open about uh, just, you know, wanting to give everything he had to you, kind of. Yeah. That's cool. Um, well, this is this is uh, this is not the direction I thought the interview was going to go, but I absolutely love it. <laughs> so uh, you, you talked a little bit about moving on out there, Europe, but the, the first sort of change up that you had was uh, Team Freedom. Um, and, you know, we had talked already about the, sort of the relationship with uh, either the fans or your parents or whatever it was and, and trying to just sort of get out of the SA region. Uh, was there anything weird about like the first time that you left playing against your old teammates that you had, you'd played against? Like, I know you were part of that Balrog uh, squad and I think Ben Jazz was on it or something uh, that you ended up like playing against later when you're playing on Team Freedom. What, what was sort of that experience like of of sort of leaving a region and playing against your old teammates? Because NA and SA were still against each other at that time period. Yeah. Uh, back then, Peru scene was a mess. Okay. So I didn't have like... Before I I was I was like 15 when I played with Balrogs, and uh, I kind of felt betrayed in a way because there was a lot of team swapping and player switching. Mm. So uh, basically, summary is like I decided not to go to some team, and then I got left out because I didn't want to go to that team because it was too far away from my house. It was mm. like an hour and a half car, so I thought it was crazy how long, how far away it was. But point is like, uh, back then I had a different mentality. Back then I, I thought that NA was just way superior to South America. Mm. So when I play against them, I, I feel like I I swapped teams and I was on the winning team. So okay, kind of felt a little cocky back then. I, I enjoy playing <laughs> against Peruvians too, because also the North Americans, they don't you know the best opinion about South America. I was talking back then, 2016, 2017, right? Yeah. Like, uh, I was like, so unprofessional. They're so lazy. If we scream some South American team, they will be late. Always like 15 minute delay, a lot of pauses. There's still some of that today, but right. it's improved so much uh, considering how it was back then. It was crazy how undisciplined a lot of players were. Hmm. So I did enjoy beating them. It was like, for me, it was a way to show them that, yes, if you maybe you're very good, maybe you're very talented, but if you don't get together and you don't practice and you don't play for the same objective, you're not going anywhere. And I think that Team Freedom squad, it wasn't that good, but we had a couple of cute sta uh, strats mm -hmm. that are revolved around, I don't know, doing random shit like it's Ben without passive. I don't know if it was like a BSJ <laughs> strat or like he plays Ben <laughs> with a so Dominator, Max Stun, Max Warcry, and we just ran a stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I play silencer middle, and so I was just getting intelligence all the time, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it was pretty cool. It was the first team that I was trying to develop like new strategies, but we weren't good enough. So I remember we were playing for a. It was not Boston Major. It was uh, Kiev. Kiev Major. There you go. Yeah. We lost to 
Onyx, which was uh, mm. Abed's team, yeah. Demon, Abed, which is pretty funny because, like, before playing a, a small uh, change of subject, which is before going to the season one DPC, I realized that every time I'm playing an NA, Abed comes to NA. <laughs> the last time Abed was in NA, I was playing on Team Freedom, and I also lost to him. He beat me turn one and Team Onyx, so he's like my competition. Yeah, I uh, guess now you're almost... not going mid against him this time, though. Yeah, but that's okay, the only thing changed. <laughs> Well, that's. But, uh, by the way, yeah, was that Freedom Team where you had a bunch of different ones? Was that the one where it was like, uh, Jubei was playing Kunkka and you had Storm Spirit or something, and you kept like just Xing and zipping out waves? Was that your team or is that a different team? I'm thinking of. I think no, probably not me because I okay. never play much Storm Spirit or, or Kunkka. Was it Tinker? I think it could be Tinker. Okay. I think I think we play against DC, which is like Weha Misery, and I was like Team Freedom with ix mike i think it was one of those games but i don't know could yeah, okay. be interesting uh yeah it was fun to play with them but it got very toxic and it was also very toxic back then so i got it's a Dota. i got a lot of blame for that team that oh. was very underserved just because i was like the young guy who of course i was very young and stupid so right. i will not like excuse myself from that all that my past teammates know this that you know but uh <laughs> i was just a little kid like these guys were older and they kind of mistreated me in a way that yeah. I will call out right now that I was very toxic during 2018-17 because the way I learned to talk about Dota was so toxic from NA, so toxic. Hmm. My way of teaching stuff, it was based on making my teammate feel stupid so he realizes how dumb doing this is. Really? And so bad. Yeah, I was very toxic in the way I taught people and I couldn't help me because... I didn't know all the way. That's how I had been doing stuff for like a full year. Or so, and that's how I learned. I was like, okay, if you think what I'm doing is flaming, you know, try like playing with this guy. And I, I put up with it. So, whatever you're complaining about is like yeah. so much better. And that's such a bad mentality to have. I was such a bad, bad teammate back then because of it. So, I had to erase some of that knowledge of like, I still remember there's a certain episode with Juve where like, Let's say I, I think I was tiny, okay? And back then the bounty room, it was low ground. So right. I was like high ground. And I see some guy, the enemy was like spawning bounty room. He's coming for the rune. I come and I didn't toss him. Like he took, takes the rune, something like that. And then Joey's is like, are you fucking stupid? I don't know if I can say this on the post. It's but fine, the it's like, fine, it's fine, yeah. He just went like he went off on me and we just paused the game and Eagle's like, yo, Joey, relax. Eagle, Eagle was like the... He helped me he a lot. He was right? Yeah, he was the father of the team too. He always like messaged me after the game, like relax, you know, all these guys get a little intensive, but you know, that's how huh. it is, you know, and blah blah. Helped me a lot. He's such a nice guy, Eagle. I'm he doesn't play anymore, but if he watches this, you know, he was such a nice guy. I appreciate him. But uh I still remember it. It's crazy, but he marked me in such a way that I felt so stupid. And he made me feel so stupid about making that mistake that I went over like repeating this with my next teammates because that's how I learned to uh, play Dota, how to teach your teammate not do not don't do this again, and you make them feel that. Right. Well, it's, yeah. it's so interesting because you know you talking about how that's something that then you carry on. You know, you gotta wonder where where did all that start? Because it it it's like it feels like that's something that just is inherent kind of in Dota, where people talk that way about each other when you're playing in pubs. Um, I'm not sure if at, at your level it's probably a different story, but like in in everything that I feel like I see, people sort of have that let's try and uh you know make this person feel bad because then i don't have to feel as bad about my bad play or something right um and it it makes me wonder where all of that began because it's something that i think it, like exists in pubs constantly um i'm surprised that it exists in pro teams but i would imagine that it probably has gone down a lot uh for some of these things but it's uh that that sort of toxic behavior in general that can exist uh in a game where you know you, you need your teammates to play well uh it's and not mistakes great. happen so often right like yeah. there's so many mistakes so like you react in this way to one mistake it's like how how are you gonna get to taking the enemy throne if you're like right. already upset about missing two last mm. right something totally. like that i think uh we could all use a little bit of uh you know anger management issues and, and talks about it figure out how to make that work well, yeah <laughs> that's uh that's interesting so you know you talked about going back afterwards though uh after team freedom um you had some good results had some bad results played well uh but you went back to infamous and ti7 came around um 
do you want to talk first of all just before we get into that like what, what sort of what was it like coming back how did the the sort of region receive you uh <laughs> was it okay or was it not so good uh some people received me as some sort of like prophet i was like you know like this kid is <laughs> really? so young he comes from an a he's on a safe region he's gonna take us to ti huh. some people receive me like this and other people receive me like oh so this guy i think he's like a gringo mm. so i got a i got a lot of annoying comments because of that of like me speaking english and stuff even my teammates uh when i first joined infamous i mean matthew he kept making the same joke about like uh Yo guys, we gotta talk in English or tomorrow's not gonna understand that. <laughs> you know, so like, no, I I took it fine because I was also still going to school back then. Like when I when I joined Infamous, I had just quit school. But mm. before that, I was like used to the school the dynamic, so it didn't bother me much. But they when you did say bother school, me. Sometimes. School dynamic. What do you mean by that? Like. Sort of Golden Eye is like you're hanging with your friends and they're all making funny remarks and you know Got you're it. always bothering each other, that type of thing. So okay. I didn't take it to heart, but they did annoy me sometimes. That's but funny. uh yeah, that team had a lot of expectations. There was a lot of pressure on my shoulders to like deliver and carry and you know, Sumail one TI when he was like uh sixteen, so I had the same pressure going of like, oh everyone thought I was like, Oh, this is our Sumail, you know, okay. So every time I had a bad game, it's like so this guy fake news or what's happening guys mm. but uh i didn't care about it much back then it was different i just enjoy playing the game too much i was still like so new to everything that meant dota uh with that team i went to my first international land and everything was just like such a fun experience even losing i was like this is professional dota i was like my first yeah. year playing professional dota i was like every even like losing i enjoyed it uh, it's kind of crazy there, there's uh, yeah. a, definitely a big difference between LAN Dota and online Dota and how that feels. Um, and like seeing the players that you play against in the morning when you like go down for breakfast or whatever and they're in the hall there and you see these people that you've only watched on like TV or something or on your computers before. It's it's definitely a weird experience. Um, it is. It is. I, I remember my first line, I was like, as you described, it was breakfast, and I was looking at Weha. I remember it was a uh, Planet Odd Weha yeah. with Misery and Blitz, and there were the Odd Finim guys too. It was some Chinese land. There were the I don't remember the Happy Feet team huh. from CEA, but it was just crazy. I was looking at all these people like, oh my god, you know that's Blitz's daughter. He's eating an <laughs> apple. That's crazy, <laughs> man. That. That's crazy. And then I had to play this guy. So yeah. very unique experience that you live once you enjoy it and then you never look back because you're competing you cannot think about this sort of stuff in game right so right that's a good point point. and i think like the pressure there it can definitely get to as well and like i think that you know around that ti time uh you were also it wasn't just the pressure of like you being a big mid star but it felt like infamous also often just drafted around you having a good game whether it was your viper uh, or like Queen of Pain um, or Shadow Fiend or whoever it was, like those were sort of those heroes that were built around you and the, the team was built around you. Uh, did you kind of feel the weight of it when you were playing in the games there? And obviously, you know, when people started like sending three heroes mid at you? <laughs> yeah, I, I I really like after TI7, I decided I didn't want to play mid anymore. Yeah. Uh, I just got the thing is, I, I know it, I know this to detail. Uh, we were a very lazy team. There were mm -hmm. a lot of like, uh, internal problems that happened just before going to TI that that made us uh, separate each other. We weren't a team when we got there. Hmm. We became a team when the tournament started because TI hype and all the stuff was like, we were going to play. But then once we lost, we immediately disbanded. Once we got eliminated, it was a complete disband as soon as we lost to OG. Yeah. And the thing that happened is that back then there was an extra creep mid. So a lot oh, of teams man. realize that the best condition, the, the best way to approach the game is to put your carry condition in the mid lane because there's so much farm, he gets so fat. And we did the same. So I was always giving like these Linas and these Quaps, and I was getting like 11 minute Orchid. I was in like 14 minute Bloodstone. I was like, I farmed pretty well on my heroes and mm -hmm. especially the agility ones like Viper and PL, which are the games we won. But uh, we weren't a mature team enough to identify our win conditions and play around them. So we just kind of did whatever came to our minds in the game. So if this guy wanted to play this, he will play it. If I wanted to play that, I will play it. So right. I mean, most of my games at TI, it was just me playing against Sumail. But it was Sumail with 
back then it was Sai position four with mm. Sai middle. So I was getting Fisher, I was getting Nick's mana burned, <laughs> I was getting Bane and Feeble every time. And we were playing an old patch. We were still playing the roaming four, right. not the babysitter four. So we got punished a lot. And that was getting all the bounty runes, which gave you XP too. So it didn't hurt. God, that, yeah. that was such a crazy patch. Um, yeah. The other thing about that, that sort of, uh, I, I sort of remember as well was that um, you went out to OG actually. It was the best of one against them, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and like the differences in terms of, could, were you the captain on that team also? Uh, no, I mean, I couldn't be a captain because people didn't respect me enough because <laughs> okay. of my age back then, you know, like, I couldn't really, but I was involved a lot in the strategy because I was interested in it. I was like, we got to make draft. Like when we started the team, I saw like this, uh, chalk board, I think it is where you take notes, you know, with, mm, uh, yeah. chalk. And uh, I was like, why is no one using this? And then it's like, oh, like some team used like some version of infamous used it once, but then. Since then, no one has touched it. And I grabbed it, I put it next to my computer, and I started writing down our picks. I was like, okay, we win when we pick Razor. We win when we pick Rubik. So let's open this, right? Yeah. And then everyone looked at me like, what is he saying, right? But yeah. So I wasn't really the captain, but I was always doing my best to like understand strategy and help my team with like picks and stuff. It was very basic back then. There was only was two bands at the start. <laughs> yep. That's crazy. I, I think that that's such an interesting idea too, because nowadays pe I think teams like use everything, you know, people use like Excel spreadsheets to try and like track all the different heroes that they're playing yes. and all that stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, just seeing a region that is trying to catch up to all of that. It's such a, it's such a big leap to try and make. <laughs> well, we got programs that they just have the entire data of the enemy team and their picks and their combinations. So they know exactly what not to give you. You right. know, they have this program, the this AI that just tells them the result. Mm. But back then in 2017, I had to go for thought of uh, and I had to like <laughs> go to my bed and I talked to Benjas and I'd be like, oh mm, Benjas, what do you think is a cool combination with LC? And it was like, I think troll. I think my troll is pretty good because I press ult and I give him attack speed. Yeah. That was the old troll ultimate. So it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, so LC plus troll, that's pretty good. And then we can add the silencer. And that was like our, we had two free strats coming into <laughs> TI. And that was like three strats. We had LC silencer, LC troll, and then Viper plus clock or Viper plus whatever. It's like Roman strat. And Quop plus Ricky. Mm. I remember that. <laughs> they were so basic, man. So basic. Wait, was that the so version of it where you got the blink dagger on Quop too? Or was that not you? Did no, that was, I, I didn't do that first, but I've done it a couple of times okay. because level blink is just like snowballing built. I'm yeah. winning so hard that I just want to get from one point of the map to the other as fast as I can without having to commit TP. Because gotcha. back then, there wasn't a backpack or TP slot, right? Right, yeah. So the TP was more valuable. Damn, dude. That's crazy. <laughs> Such a wild time. It's it's so weird thinking about how much Dota has changed. Um. Have you yeah. sort of have you liked the way that the the changes in Dota have gone? Do you feel like you uh, you're enjoying the game now? I know teams have like or players each individually have really different views on it. Do you like where it's at? I think so. I think Icebreak has been pushing the game to becoming faster, less farming, more fighting, uh, more team oriented. There is less individual plays throughout the game, and the individual plays are always to achieve certain team objectives, like. If there's a shaker getting a nice echo, it's to win the team fight and take Roshan. It's not like right. he solo kills some guy randomly on the map. That used to happen way more often where people were just looking to solo kill the other guy 100 to 0 every time. Right. So the only thing I dislike about the changes is I even like the neutral items. I think the neutral items are a different layer of complexity of like uh, having to go farm them, finding them, what item is good on every hero, you know, like this goes to him, this goes to him. Then supports become heroes because mm. before supporters were like, you know, they're a bitch. Give me, give me salve, give me ward, chicken cost money, flying chicken yeah. cost money, observer cost money, everything cost money. Supporters were just walking with Bracer, man. It was so boring <laughs> to play support back then. That's why yeah. some teams are outdated when their position five is viewed as like some peon. Right. He's not a peon. Position five is a hero now. He, yeah. His contribution is important to the game. Before, it could be like Brown Boots, Mino Freddy, and still win the game. And the position five concept was like, oh, this guy drafts for the team. So he gets to be like really bad. He doesn't even press spells in game. He just like drafts and plays the hero, plays his words. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, uh, I think it's 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 cool. It like makes the game I think more fun for a bigger population. If twenty percent of your like population of Dota players is like not having fun, <laughs> it's it's kind of bad. Um, so that's pretty cool. I, I the like only play. thing I dislike, sorry to interrupt, Go but it, I gotta bring it up. It's like I hate that Dota takes cons takes a. Uh, not the really take comes but I feel like some heroes are very similar to League of Legends heroes, like Void Spirit. I just think that having a hero like Void Spirit the defeats the purpose of having a hero like uh Drow Ranger. I guess Drow got a little reworked, but like hero that has two passives. Like I'm Spectre man. I have to yeah. farm creeps and I have two passive. This guy has stun, slow, jump Get in, get out, farm, solo kill, but then he does you, everything. You would in the be game. complaining about Void Spirit as a carry player. <laughs> yes, I hate the new heroes. I just don't understand why they have to do so much. Yeah. I just think he should introduce like a new carry hero, Agility, and he's pretty cool. He has one passive, damage spell, you know, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't have to have 10 spells, different mechanic. Like, mm. look at Pango, right? Different mechanic. Like, it's always like a unique mechanic that's going to break the game for a full year because yeah. he keeps having to patch the hero, patch the hero until he's normal. Grimshow, Pango, Monkey, all of them. I'm yeah, sorry. I guess it's fun though. It's the problem is that I understand that it's terrible from a competitive point of view, but it's really fun to play those heroes. Yeah, it is. I like voice. I like playing the hero. To be honest <laughs> with you, that's what I'm talking about. When I'm playing it, I just hate this hero. I don't understand why he comes to my lane and he does everything. <laughs> he doesn't have like soul weakness, and you can see it in draft. There's a lot of teams that they yeah. just blind pick boy spirit. They don't care. Quincy I mean, group. if your player is good enough, right? It'd be like Queen, right? Yeah. Queen boy spirit. He has like. A thousand good matchups. He knows how to play every matchup. He knows how to rotate. He knows the item value. And it's like, how do you stop him? You have not to feed the queen. Don't feed the queen, Callahan, and you're gonna be fine. It's <laughs> so funny. I love that. Um, that, that, and that's something maybe we can get back to a little bit later on as well. Is like that sort of relationship. I guess we can talk about it now. Why not? Um, the 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 DPC ended up. You guys did manage to take on down Quincy Crew. Uh, what what sort of was your final feeling i mean the tiebreakers happened uh I, I i imagine that that was pretty frustrating at the time you guys did end up going out zero and two but at the same time uh you're able to force those top two teams in north america to tiebreakers um you talked about sort of this like mentality you have of just thinking forward to ti uh are, are you guys taking like any breaks at all or is it just all training all the time what's the what's the feeling about how it all went down mm -hmm. So let's start with the tiebreakers. So going to tiebreakers, we had some fire going because like, everyone like they just talk shit any Dota. You know, they're like, oh, EG, they're full of Europeans and they're gonna like stomp any Dota because any Dota is trash. And no, it's not. Any Dota is pretty good. It's right. just there's not that many teams. Like, but the teams are, are like top. They're pretty good. EG is pretty good. Queens is pretty good. I think our team is, has potential and it's good enough. It's good enough to be tier two, but we're not there yet. But this tie record was cool because we showed the world because everybody was watching those games, you know, like it, I don't know how many views it had, but the point is like there were a lot of people watching and they everybody expected us to lose, like two zero, getting stumped, and it's like no, it's not the reality. It's not that far away from like what we are, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh there was a force in the tiebreaker, I mean. Yeah. But then going into tiebreaker, uh we kinda choked a bit. Against EG we had a weaker draft. We were talking so much and coming up with a strategy. Guys, we got them. We got them. We got the <laughs> corner. And then we messed up some picks. And their strategy was just better. They kind of dismantled us when we played this VO1. We're like, you could tell that they were the stronger team. They read our smokes. They had the better plan. They had the better win condition. And they executed clean. Hmm. They didn't have to play the best game of their life. They just needed clean execution. And right. they had it. And then going to Quincy... Ah, everybody used choke, man. Brian was playing Viper after like for an entire two months. He was talking that don't like he was trying to convince me to play the Viper. Okay, <laughs> I was like, you should play the Viper tomorrow. I don't like Viper, man. You're a good Viper player. You should play it. I was like, yeah, sure, man. Like you play some carry, maybe we can find some strategy. You know, like I can play the Viper. And then somehow the most important game of the entire season, we end up with Brian's Viper. Yeah. Against Queen's Puck. So I think the strategy was like. 50 50. I think draft wise, I think Queen C had a 10% edge. It was like 60 40, to be honest. But mm -hmm. uh, I also feel like I let down my team. I I think I could have carried the Hersa game. I have a clear, uh, I have like, 
good understanding of what I should have done to win that game. I think mm. they fucked up too because it was a B01. They right. got nervous for some reason. Jawar tried to like kill me, yeah. and then I just turned back and I killed him, and then I killed Queen, and then I killed some guy, and everyone was like screaming, you know, like Discord and stuff. It's like, kill this guy, kill this guy, kill this guy, check Russian, get check. Russia. But then I got two like ten stop, so. Mm. I played it safe. I went for Satanic. I should have gone for Rapier. I should have played to win. Yeah. I didn't play to win. I, I got scared a bit because there was so much pressure in that game. And yeah. we had we didn't have like we weren't winning. We had one shot because right. they bought back their free cores and we got the Aegis. Mm -hmm. So we had a small opportunity to win the game. And I didn't go for it. And when you lose tournaments like that, you have two options. You can quit the game because you can be like, I'm not good enough. You know, I gave it my all and it's not good enough. Or you can be like, no, I see what I should have done. I see the line. Right. So now that I have a clear idea of what I should improve, I'm going to go for it. Dude, you and sound that's so been motivated. my mentality. Yeah. After I lost, next day, I started spamming pups. I, I've, I'm i going back to my old training habits. I used to have better training habits. Hmm. This last season, I was practicing. I was training, doing my screams, playing some pups. But eh, I didn't really push myself to a limit. I was like, I was happy with what I had, and like, I thought the team was good enough. But now, after losing to Quincy, it like it hurt me the way we lost. It hurt me so much to like, I I I saw the opportunity. I didn't take it. It's like it was the last train, and I didn't jump on it. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, fortunately, it's not the end of the season, right? That's why you have to clear objective in mind. It's like TI10. Yeah. So. Just gotta fix some stuff, you know, just like personal stuff. The entire team to talk more about them is like Moon had this thing where like his cat was sick and he died. It was very sad for everyone. It was very sad for him. So yeah. he was a little sad. I don't think he's playing pops. Everyone's just like right now we're on a break. Mm -hmm. Uh even if we're still playing the BTS Americas, we're not screaming or anything. We're just kinda of playing the tournament and everyone's free to do whatever they want. But me personally, man. I'm thinking every day to like grind the most. I'm not stopping. And you know, this Queen Callahan guy, he wasn't that good. Like he wasn't that good before. Like 2017, 2018. Yeah, he was a good player. Right. But he's practiced so much, man. And I'm yeah. pretty sure this is why you brought up the attitude thing because yeah. he's trained so much. He has the best training habits in NA. So and it shows he's the most solid player. He he still has bad games, but his uh, mistake margin, you know, it's yeah. like so small like yes he will have a bad game but out of a thousand games out of 100 games there's this one scenario where he chokes or he didn't respond properly but he practices so much that when we lost to quincy i i talked to Bell, I was like do you really think that their cores deserve winning more than us and we both answered that yes they grinded more they try harder they you could tell in game that they wanted it more more than us hmm. and if we didn't care about it we would be probably chilling right now but it, i hate that it happened i hate that we have to lose to see it hmm. but at least we see it now that have to put a hundred percent of your soul and passion into the game otherwise you're gonna regret it and that small regret it doesn't go away it's like a taint on your shirt it's like you drop some wine on a white shirt it doesn't go away your yeah. brain doesn't forget about it I could still talk to my children and be like, I remember when I lost to Mr. <laughs> Queen Callahan, you know, violent talk to I should have practiced more pops, man. I should have been spamming pops, man. So I don't want to be that guy. I want to tell them that I gave it my all and maybe I went to TI, maybe I didn't, but I gave it my all and maybe inspired them instead. That's so awesome. Um, I, I, I think that there's something there too, which is like sort of the idea of, of kind of wanting to create a legacy, but also creating like sort of a, a, a I mean, I guess this is an interesting question. When when you play, I, I remember in another interview that you did, you talked about sort of the effect that like Dota fame can have on a player, uh, and sometimes it can be negative, uh, depending upon how it works. And like, what what what's been your relationship with like the fandom? Because it feels like you really built up another sort of like, or I guess rebuilt a fandom down in South America through your time there before you came back up and played with Undying, like. What's sort of that relationship like of, of, of having like, I mean, in a, in a way it again, like obviously there's a lot of different teams in South America now that are good, but it still feels like you have a really big fan base down there. Um, do you think about that very much? Do you sort of like try and engage with them a lot? What What's sort of been your relationship like with that? Yeah, I appreciate my fans more. Before I used to fight them, I, I, uh, I dislike having a Peru fan base because I thought it was like holding me back to become an international star. 
and this is the fame that I talk about that can be toxic because I got addicted to this international fame where you know, I play with Weha, I go to TIs, I go to May. You know, I only play Mayors, man. You know, I don't play open qualifiers. <laughs> that type of ego that a lot of Dota players used to have or still have, right. it's so toxic because Dota is like a marathon. It's a long run thing. It's uh, one day you're winning, one day you're the hottest, and then the next day new patch comes. There's these new guys like playing a lot of pups. And then you're old news, man, and everyone forgets about you. So yeah, I had to go back to Peru. I had to regain my fans. I had to. I opened up, opened up to them a little bit too, because uh, I was perceived as this robot with like no feelings, and uh, he hated his fan base and stuff. But no, I was just like I was hurt by the way they treated me. With like they had so many expectations for me, like being coming this next to mail and stuff, blah blah blah. And then feeling like I was a disappointment when I was just being me, man. I cannot be someone else. I can just be the best version of myself. Right. So when I came to peace with this, my game improved a lot. I feel like I could play Dota without feeling weird of having people watching me that they dislike me. And I appreciate their support a lot now too because uh, sometimes I see Twitch chat and there's like a lot of Peruvian fans and even if they tell them not to speak Spanish, they will speak their Spanish and be like, tomato, I love you, go tomato. And yeah, it's nice to see. Yeah. Glad that people care about me and uh, I try my best to put on a show and uh, do the best that I can do with this opportunity of being a pro player and playing the best thought out there is, right? Because yeah. like, I'm right there, man. I, I just missed the major, but if I, if I had gone to the major, I'd be like top 16 team of the world, blah, blah, blah. You know, the mm. drill. Oh. And that's how thought is. So one last question here. Uh, long term, uh, there's, there's sometimes, you know, players that will leave a region or will leave a a place uh long term do you want to end up being an SA when, when all is said and done when your sort of career is coming down do you do you want to end up there end up where you are right now back home uh probably I mean you never know what's gonna happen but I think it will be I think everyone at some point they want to chill a bit go back home relax but they still love the game right like you look at the PPDs and the moon meanders and they can kind of went back to being comfy, being at their home, play with their local teams. But they're still trying their hardest to make it back. So maybe that's going to be me in a couple of years. I'm going to have more experience. I'm going to be more mature. I'm going to be able to handle people better. I'm going to be able to make my own team and be like, oh, I want this guy. I want this guy. And I'm going to talk to him one-on-one. One one. You know, it's, there's stuff that some qualities that you need to have to be able to have your own team, like talking to someone eye to eye. I struggle a little bit with that. I'm still a little too shy to become a captain for people to like feel this. For example, Moon, something that he's really good at is he gives confidence to his team. He's like, guys, today we're going to own these guys. We're going to yeah. fuck them up. Fuck them up. And he's like, yeah. And even Brad, he's like super like, I'm quiet, but Brad is like even quieter. We're like, kind of like this, how quiet we both are. And then he's just getting hyped. He's like, yeah, let's fucking go. <laughs> and then like, I remember the tiebreakers. It was the first time I was hearing Brian go like, yeah, let's fuck him up. Fuck him up. Like, Holy <laughs> goodness, Brian, what's happening? And it's all the moon under effect. So I think a good captain has to be able to inspire his players. The same for like, uh, you look back, you know, like Sander the Grey, you know, uh, wow. Napoleon, all these guys, you know, they That's inspire the their troops. You got to inspire them, man, to get, they got to fight for you. They're going to get you there. So you need to do like, his whole speeches and uh, mm. teaching them, treating them well. Like, yeah. otherwise you don't have an army. And if you don't become this team, like you, if you don't unify your minds towards the same objective, you don't achieve anything. When it comes to team games like this, so having a guy like Moon having this quality is so important. I I imagine that every top tier one team has like this captain that just unifies everyone. They brings them together, different ways, but same thing. Yeah, I just I keep on imagining Moon Mander the Great Bonaparte in like a Napoleon hat, just his face on it. That sounds great. Um, I did say <laughs> I, I did say last question before, but uh, I, I actually realized that there was one more one that um I, I sort of want to touch on. I'm trying to get everybody's feel on it. Uh, it's a little bit about some of the 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 questions about players coming from other regions, which I feel like is a great opportunity to talk to you because obviously you know you've had a ton of experience in NA, but you're also you know, coming from South America as well. Um, I, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on, like, if there should be sort of hard and fast boundaries on players and teams coming together, like, should there be sort of 
uh, hard boundaries on how many players from outside of a region come on in. And if you think there should be, where should those boundaries kind of be set? Uh, a tough question. Yeah, I think as long as you're competing and living in the region, it's yeah. fine. Because uh, it's such a like old way to see it, like old fashioned way of like, oh, you're not from here, you're not from the United States, you're not from Canada, you're not allowed to play in North American region. It's like such an old way to see it. I can tell you that guys like Crit, for example, they do so much for the region, man. Like they come to NA, they bring these new ideas from Europe, they try hard in pubs. Suddenly, like, these position four that are really bad, top 300 from NA, they're like, oh, look, like I'm going to watch re great replays. And suddenly, they improve, they get better at the game. That's different approach. Even Isaac Sai, such a respectful guy, such a nice guy. This guy doesn't feed pups. This guy doesn't rage in pups. He doesn't flame anyone. Seeing the difference from, like, he's the same as you. He's exactly like you. He's a total player. He loves the game. But the way he approaches it is so differently. And mm. seeing this is so rich. It, I think uh, having European players, like not only European, but like from different countries come to NA has helped the region stay alive. If there was a strict rule, there wouldn't be NA right now, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So I think it's healthy for everyone, every region. Also, a lot of players, uh, they play with who they want to play. Yeah. Like, if uh, if RTC goes to China and you want to play with RTC, you will follow RTC to China. That's how a lot of players feel. So they don't, like even Savior Light. He doesn't even you don't pay much attention to the region you're playing for. You're kind of there just to give it your best, and you want to play with the people you're playing with. Like I wanted to play with Brawl, and when I was making the team with Brawl, I was like, oh, I'm also with Dubu, and I'm like, I want to play with Dubu. If these guys told me that the best chance we got was move to CA and play CA pubs and live in the Philippines. I would say yes, right? Because it doesn't matter. It's, the region doesn't matter. You're still gonna do your best, and as long as you're playing with the people you like, then it's gonna be enjoyable. So it's gonna be fun. So you're gonna go for it. Okay. So yeah, that's my take on it. I appreciate it. Uh, I think that that's a that's it's a it's a good one to hear. Um, and I appreciate you hopping on so much to talk forever. Uh, it's been great. You 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 sound so confident and so like just about it and ready to go. I, I can't wait to keep watching you going forward into season two as well. Um, Thank you. And no problem. Any final shout outs you want to give to fans, to people, where can people find you? Uh, where can people check out your stream? All that stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, shout out to all my English fans. Of course. Shout out to my Spanish fans. If they're they're going to be watching this because they know their language and stuff. I appreciate you all. And I love seeing your comments on Twitch chat on my Twitter, my Facebook, anything. My social media is always tomorrow, and like everything, my Instagram, my Twitch. I recently gone back to streaming on Twitch mm. because uh, I hadn't been streaming because I had a Facebook contract, but right now I'm streaming again Twitch, the same tomorrow. So if you want to check me out, I'm going to be there. And uh, thank you for having me here. It's been a lovely interview. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. And uh, it's been fun. I have always enjoyed uh, opening my mind because... Then I can look back when I'm older and be like, oh, it's so cute. That's so fun how I thought, how I looked at it. So, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yes, I'm very excited for the next season. I'm going to try my – I'm going to do – if if you think I did well or decent last season, you know, I'm going to do, like, twice better. I'm going to work for it. So, yeah. Awesome. Ready. Well, thank you so much again, and uh, we'll see you all next time.